Welcome. Family. Movies brief here. Here. Today, I am going to explain an American romantic comedy called The Invention of Lying. Spoilers ahead. Watch out. And take care. The movie starts with a man narrating about a world where humans have evolved into beings who cannot tell a lie. Because of this, everyone speaks the truth, including the beggars, businessmen, and even the beloved president himself. The narrator introduces Mark Bellison as a loser who is about to change his luck by telling the world's first lie. In the first scene, Mark approaches a beautiful woman named Anna to take her on a first date. Anna remarks with frustration that Mark disturbed her while she was pleasuring herself. She also comments that Mark is early and needs to wait for her to get ready. Mark expresses his concern that he can only afford a cheaper restaurant. He further says that his boss will probably fire him in the next week, and he does not possess any financial assets, despite being in his late 40s. Anna comes down and states that she does not find Mark attractive enough. Mark, who is used to getting similar attention from women, sighs as they come out of the room. The two then enter a restaurant, where the waiter is also brutally honest with them. He comments that Anna is out of Mark's league, and asks if she is his daughter. Embarrassed, Mark thanks him and asks him to leave. He then asks Anna about herself. She replies that she has a job that pays well, so she is thriving in life. She gets a phone call from her mother and tells her that Mark is not good looking and does not earn well. Upon her mother's query, she answers that she is neither kissing nor sharing the bed with him tonight. As they leave, Mark thanks Anna for seeing him. The scene moves to the lecture film's studio, where a man is demonstrating Napoleon's story. As Mark appears, the man introduces him to the crowd as a screenplay writer of the company. Mark greets them with a smile, which soon changes to embarrassment when the man truthfully announces Mark to be one of the least successful employees who is getting fired soon. Mark arrives at the office and gets teased by his colleague Shelley for his incompetence. The boss, Anthony, comes out and fires Mark for his pathetic writing about the Black Plague. At the same time, Mark discovers Anna's mail, stating that despite liking his company, she is not interested in him on account of his genetic looks, financial condition, and position in life, which are all of the determinants for marrying people. Shelley rubs salt into Mark's wounds with her honesty, saying that the best part of the mail is about his bad looks. When Mark walks out of his office, Shelley and Brad, Mark's competitor, say that they've always loathed Mark working with them. Brad further says that Mark will always be a loser. This is a lot of truth bombs for one day. What did these people talk about before? Mark then enters a nursing home, which in this world is called a sad place for hopeless old people. He is there to see his mother, Martha Bellison. He tells Martha about losing his job. He stresses that his mother is a loser too, and they come from a long line of losers. Later, at home, Mark's landlord approaches him, asking for the rent. After Mark shares his condition, the landlord gives him a single day to get his stuff out of the house, because he is no longer competent to pay the rent. Mark goes to a bank to close his account and withdraw all the money he has. The cashier informs him that they cannot help him close the account because the system is down, but they can provide him the cash. The cashier then asks him his saving amount, as they cannot see him through the system. Mark says that he wants $800, while his heart beats rapidly. Just then, the system comes back, and the cashier checks his account, which has only $300. The cashier says that the system might have been faulty, and believes Mark instead. She gives him $800, and apologizes for the system's fault. Mark is astonished to receive this amount that he does not have in his account, and he leaves the bank with a huge smile. He pays his rent, and returns to his room. An overwhelmed Mark shares to his friends about his deed being unfathomable. He has just discovered lying. But his friends, who are unfamiliar with the concept, do not understand him. Mark tests his new skill by changing his name every few minutes, and his friends believe him every time. Then, he asks his friends what they would do first if they could do anything in the world. Greg says that he would have intercourse with a girl, so to try it, Mark goes outside and calls a girl past him. She ignores him at first, but stops at once when Mark mentions that the world will end if she does not have sex with him at this moment. The girl hurriedly takes a surprised Mark to a motel. When they reach there, Mark asks the girl to introduce herself, but the girl shouts that they have to do it soon for the sake of the world. Mark feels awkward himself, and pretends to make a call to NASA. He says that NASA has confirmed the world will not end, and they need not sleep together. 
Huh, rectifying a lie with another lie, Mark is on the fast track to becoming a politician. Following this, he returns to his friends and asks them, aside from being with a girl, what would they do if they could do anything in the world? They cannot think of anything, and in turn, ask Mark what he would do. At once, Mark replies that he would get all the money in the world. All this room aspires to is misogyny and greed. This is dark. After that, Mark and Greg go for a ride, as Greg drives the car totally drunk. A police officer stops them and tries to arrest Greg for drunk driving. But when Mark simply states that his friend is not drunk, the officer believes him. He even apologizes and leaves the scene. The friends enter a casino where Mark insists on playing roulette. He plays his chance on 28, but sees that the roulette is marked 35. So, he slyly points and yells at everyone to look at something unusual ahead. As everybody looks away, Mark drags his bet to 35 and claims it. The dealer doesn't doubt him and provides Mark with his prize. In a similar way, Mark cheats several times and comes out of the casino with a large sum. Later, he meets his depressed friend Frank in an elevator, who shares that he is about to commit suicide. Mark thinks about it and tells Frank that he does not need to kill himself. Frank believes him, and they both plan to hang out later that night. Mark uses the technique he has discovered to bring happiness to people's lives. That's more like it, Mark. One night, Mark calls Anna and asks her on another date. He explains that he has changed and Anna should see it herself. Anna agrees to go out with him for the last time. After hanging the phone up, Mark turns his TV on and sees a lecture film show in which the narrator praises Brad's writing. Mark gets an idea from this and goes to his table to write a story with his newfound knowledge. After completing it, he pours tea onto it and makes it look like a historical script. Mark heads to the lecture film studio and tells his boss Anthony that he has discovered historical writing in an ancient chest buried in a desert. The writing has stories about the crashing of a giant spaceship in Babylon, and it catches Anthony's attention. He asks his employees to listen to the historic story as Mark recites it. Mark reads that the Earth was saved by aliens in the 14th century. He adds that the alien king wiped out humans' memories to prevent them from remembering the events. After 700 years, a great writer, Mark Bellison, would stumble on and be put to human acknowledgement after being fired by his crappy boss, Anthony, and mocked by his colleagues, Shelby and Brad. The last sentence of the script says that the lecture films will be making a successful film and Mark will become famous and wealthy. Everyone applauds, believing the absurd writing while Brad is upset. Anthony asks Mark to get to work on that film soon. The next day, Mark takes Anna to an expensive restaurant for their date. Anna congratulates Mark for selling his script and asks about his family. Mark shares that his father is an alcoholic and his mother is in a nursing home. He plans to take her out of the nursing home the next day and get her a mansion. Mark finally asks Anna if she wants to spend her life with him since he is now wealthy and successful. Though Anna likes him for his wealth and success, she rejects him because of his appearance and remarks that she does not want her kids to be fat with snub noses. Disappointed, Mark takes a sip of his drink and answers a phone call. He finds out that his mother is in critical condition and rushes to the hospital. On her deathbed, Martha shares that she is frightened of dying, for it is an eternity of nothingness. As her vitals drop, Mark lies to his mother, saying that she will be in her favorite place after death, young and juvenile, together with her loved ones. As Martha hears this, she smiles with excitement and soon passes away. The doctor and nurses, who just heard Mark talk to his mother, ask him to talk more about life after death. But saddened by the loss, Mark returns back home with Anna. As they wake up the next morning, they share smiles, knowing that they slept on each other's shoulders the whole night. Later, Mark drives to his home to find a big crowd in front of it. Astonished, he gets past the group while a woman screams his name. The crowd quickly surrounds Mark, asking about events that will happen after death. He somehow gets inside the house and turns the TV on to see a journalist reporting the scene from outside. Soon, Anna comes to his house and asks Mark what he said to his mother. He shares everything with her, and Anna believes in it instantly. She insists that Mark tell the people everything he knows. Though in a dilemma, Mark reaches for his pen and paper and starts writing. After he is done, he comes out and reads it aloud to the crowd. He says that there is a man in the sky who knows everything. The man will provide people with the best mansion, free ice cream, and loved ones in the place after they die. He warns that people who do bad things three times in their life will be placed in terrible areas. 
while people curse the man in the sky for causing bad events. Mark convinces them that the man is also responsible for all the good events happening to people's lives. One of the women comes forth and questions Mark how he knows all of this. Mark replies that the man in the sky told him about it and leaves while the crowd clamors. The following day's news headlines make titles like NASA on the search of the man in the sky, lowering the work productivity for people thinking about mansions after death, and the man in the sky responsible for disasters and miracles. Mark goes to his office and hands over the writing of the Black Plague to his boss. The film becomes a super hit and Mark gets rich and famous overnight. While sitting in a park, Mark remarks to Anna that she is the sweetest person he has ever met. Anna also says that she enjoys his company. They get close to kissing, but Anna backs away at the thought of her children looking like Ricky Gervais. She expresses that she loves him, but cannot get past the genetics thing. Later that day, Anna comes to Mark's mansion to give him a birthday card and informs him that she is going on a date with Brad. She also shares about her intentions of sleeping with Brad, which Mark finds alarming. He convinces Anna not to be involved in physical relations with anyone before marriage. After saying this, Mark opens his birthday card, which has a birthday coupon for him to share the bed with her. She complains that since they are not married, she will not go out of the rule. Mark finds himself awkward and says that it is a shame to waste this coupon. Just then, Brad arrives and takes Anna to dinner. Throughout the dinner, he talks about his success and belittles Mark for his appearance. While Anna watches Mark's interview on TV, her mom changes the channel, saying that Mark is never going to be her friend, even though he speaks to the man in the sky. Anna does not like her talking about Mark like that and argues that he makes her feel special. The mother strongly opposes Anna with the argument that Mark will always be a loser and his children will be the same. She calls Brad at that moment and insists that Anna talk to him. Many weeks pass after the event. One day, Anna suddenly appears in front of Mark and finds him looking awful with long hair and a beard. She gives him the invitation card to her wedding and asks him to attend it for her. Mark requests that she does not marry Brad, but Anna replies that she needs to do this because she has little time to match a perfect genetic partner and have the children she has always longed for. On the day of Anna's wedding, Mark wakes up and sees Greg in a suit who offers him a shaver. He shaves his beard and attends the wedding. The priest asks the people if they offer a better genetic matchup. As silence prevails, Mark stands and puts forth his claim that Anna is happier with him. Brad in turn asks Mark why Anna is standing next to him if she is happy with Mark. Brad tells Mark to ask the man in the sky what's best for Anna, to which Mark says that Anna knows what is best for her. Mark begins to walk out, but Anna insists he ask the man in the sky. Mark finally confesses that there is no man in the sky, and he just told the story to relieve his mother during her death. Anna further questions why he did not lie to marry her. Mark replies that the lie would not make a count. At last, Anna claims that she wants little fat kids with snub noses. Hearing this puts a smile on Mark's face. As the movie concludes, Mark and Anna are seen eating breakfast with their chubby little son while Anna is pregnant with their second child. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.